Good morning, class. Today we are going to talk about circle. We actually are going to spend two weeks to uh, discuss circle. Circle is the perfect shape. We tend to overlook the strength and the benefit of designing with circle. Because we are surrounded by a cubical shape, right? Our houses, our rooms, our furniture, our computers, our notebooks, everything is in cubical shape, you know. So, but when you look into nature, do we see any cubical shape in nature? No, not at all. In nature, we see plenty of spherical form, the sun, the earth, our body, the tree, whatever, you know, the, the boundless, I can list forever that the spherical shape in nature. I always say that Mother Nature is the best designer ever. Okay, if we have to uh, we, if we have to get a mentor, okay, to be a better designer, I think the only mentor we should go for is Mother Nature, okay. So we are going to spend two weeks to talk about circle and what is the strength, advantage, and the benefit when we incorporate circle, incorporate circle in our design. This page is the big picture of the lecture. Okay, so I, I, I wish uh, it can help you to, uh, to follow the flow of the lecture. We will start from the 12 o'clock. Okay, we will uh, start uh, from the invention of wheels, which is the most important invention in human history. The invention of wheels had a fundamental impact on transportation, on manufacturing, and later on agriculture and industry. We shouldn't be surprised to see that the car companies like the uh, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and Audi Look at their, uh, the logo design. They all chose circular shapes as their logo. Why? Because circle implies smooth movement. The first wheels were created to serve as potter's wheels around 3500 BC in Mesopotamia. We still use the same way to produce pottery as the Asian people in Mesopotamia. Why? Because circular movement is the simplest, however, is also the most efficient and effective way to make things. Later, someone figure out to use wheels for, uh, for transportation. Wheels with spokes first made around 2000 BC were lighter, enabling vehicles to move faster. one of the oldest inventions of humanity and for sure one of the most important. Contemporarily, we couldn't imagine a world without it. Since it is crucial for many things. But not only for vehicles like cars or bicycles, but also, for example, for the function of a watch, 
or a merry-go-round. <laughs> the wheel was first seen on small clay tables, discovered in Mesopotamia. These tables represent a car with wheels and are more than 5,000 years old. According to archaeologists, the wheel was invented in Mesopotamia over 6,000 years ago. But we don't know who the inventor was. Supposedly, the first wheel was invented after the first human beings used cylindrical tree trunks to move heavy things. Observing this, someone very intelligent must have thought that making a wooden circle with an axis, like current wheelbarrows, it would be much easier. And from then on, the first potter's wheel and cars appeared. Crafts were the first to use a wheel and it made it easier and faster for potters to make their pots. That's to the potter's wheel. Here we can see how two wheels and an axis help this craftsman endlessly. Through time, the wheel was also used in transport. Animals didn't have to carry heavy weights on their backs. Now, thanks to wheels, they pulled the cars and moved a lot more weight with less effort. And from then, the wheel has been an essential partner to human beings. Look, look, the number of wheels we can see around us. The truth is, this is such a cool invention, don't you think? Goodbye, happy friends. See you in our next happy learning video. Wheels can also be put to many other uses. For example, a watch. The second question of last week's discussion is that why our uh, dinnerware are in uh, spherical form or in circular form instead of square. Square definitely has a better uh, use of space. Right when you uh, s arrange them horizontally, you know you will not waste uh, the space in between. But the majority of our dinner well and our cooking well are in a spherical shape. I think the reason is in the manufacturing. In case of mass manufacturing, efficiency, and economy are extremely important. What is economy? Economy means the thrift, thrifty and efficient use of resources. And these resources include material resources, but also non-material resources, which is the time and our effort and our energy. The circular movement provide us the simplest way to make the pottery. One cut, one spin, and then you make a bowl. But if you make the bowl in square shape, you have to cut four times, right? Which is more labor intensive and also time consuming. And I think this is the reason that most of our dinnerware are in spherical form. Restaurant dinnerware brings a lot to the table. It's known for rugged good looks, 
It also holds up to heavy use and repeated cleaning in commercial dishwashers. And its design can reflect the restaurant's theme. And if you know what this theme might be, please let me know. People appreciate the effort that goes into producing a fine meal, but they may not give much thought for what it takes to make the actual plate the food is served on. Making ceramic dinnerware that's restaurant quality is an intensive process that starts with a master die made of gypsum. This worker then makes a production version of the master. To do this, he pulls gypsum into a wire mesh frame above the master. There's tubing attached to the mesh frame. Air is pumped through it, causing the water in the gypsum to bubble out and evaporate. It dries and solidifies into a mirror image of the master. In this case, a platter shape. The tubing inside this production die will be used later to gently blow off the platter when formed, releasing it from the die. Another worker adds the ceramic ingredients to water. They include a plasticizer, silica sand, and different clays and minerals, like aluminium oxide. Once the clay mix has been thoroughly blended, they drain it onto a vibrating sieve to screen out large chunks and other impurities. The clay-based liquid flows through a screen into a holding tank. They pump it through this filter press. It compresses fabric-covered plastic plates to squeeze out moisture, turning the clay liquid into putty-like slabs. Ready for shaping, a worker breaks up the slabs and feeds the pieces to a pug mill. The mill shapes the clay into a long cylinder, and in the process, it sucks out air, so the dinnerware will be less prone to cracking. He slices the clay cylinder into small discs, using a wire cutter. Each of these clay discs will be shaped into one plate. They place discs onto molds on a revolving platform. The mold spins up to a metal tool, which presses the clay into the shape of the mold below. The tool also forms the back of the plate. A nozzle lubricates the metal tool between pressings. A cutter at the side trims the rims of the plates as they're formed. Unlike the platter die, these molds don't have tubing inside to blow the plates off. Instead, the heat from the dryer separates them from the molds. Once out of the molds, the plates spin on pedestals, past a sponge, which then smooths the edges. For coffee mugs, the pug mill presses out a narrower cylinder, and a knife at the exit point slices it into precise discs. The discs fall into coffee mug molds, and a tool spins the clay up against the walls of the mold to shape it into mugs. A blade at the top trims the excess from the lip. They pass under a long sponge to smooth the rims. And now for the handles. They make them in two-part molds and dry them under an infrared light. The handles must have precisely the same moisture content as the mugs, at around 16%. A worker dips the ends of each handle in a clay and glue mixture and presses it to the mug. The mugs go into a dryer and the moisture content drops further to 4%. Next, they douse the mugs with glaze inside and out, and bake them in a super hot kiln. This will make the mugs chip resistant, and will strengthen the bond between the handle and the mug. They paint the dinnerware by hand, using a ceramic stain. This stain will allow it to face repeated rigorous cleaning in restaurant dishwashers. For a different look, they apply labels to some dinnerware. This artwork has been produced using the same hard-wearing ceramic stain. The plates then head into the oven, and the heat fuses the decorative touches to them. From a liquid clay to tableware you can eat your dinner off, the process has taken about 24 hours. Mind you, I'm not sure that I want to hang around for the washing up.
Interior designers are space designers. A good interior design should be ergonomic design, which means that you should optimize the interaction between the environment and the, your customer, right? And, and also should maximize productivity by reducing operator, operator's fatigue and discomfort. So uh, when we move our arms, right, when we turn our body, right, so we are tracing a circle through the space. So therefore the furniture, the office desk, the kitchen, that they should be organized, they should be structured in a circular form, so which will be more compatible with our body form and with our circular movement. So a good kitchen design should be in a circular form, right? Everything can be uh, reached within the arm length and this will greatly reduce the uh, fatigue and discomfort uh, of your body and your lower back. The same principle should also be applied to office design. There is a design principle, it's called good continuation, which means that our brain prefers simplicity over complexity and pattern over randomness. The continuation of the curved line is more powerful for the viewer's eye than the abrupt angle line. So therefore, uh, for the picture on the right, you see the two pictures on the right, and you should see the curved line as one with a straight diagonal line cutting through it. You would not see, you know, two abruptly changed lines as the one in the right. Our brains are more likely to see the long, smooth, continuous, curved line as one because they are more effortless and they have more unity. Our minds are less likely to group elements with sharp abrupt directional changes as one and they are more stressful so therefore you see the Olympic logo right there are five circles then you will perceive it as five circles because they are they are simple pattern you know you will not perceive it as the drawing on the bottom that is too angular the direction change constantly. It is confusing. It is not a pattern. It's like a randomness that our brain, you know, will not perceive this logo as this randomness. So this tells us, you know, there is a sense of beauty in circle. Circle indeed is the most beautiful shape because a circle is the reflection of eternity. 
It has no beginning and has no end. It turns wrong and wrong without a stop. A circle has the best continuation. This particular uh, clothing style embraced the circular shape. The pattern of this cardigan is also in a circular shape. It looks so simple, but so elegant.
Pierre Cardin is a French fashion designer. He prefers geometric shapes and motifs, especially circle. In 1954, he introduced the bubble dress. He loved circle. He said, circle is my symbol. The sphere represents the creation of the world and the mother's womb. Circle is perfect. Circle is feminine. Before he became a fashion designer, he was an architect. So let's look at his house. His house is the Bubble Palace. In 1975, Kadan applied his fetish for the bubble to a monumental domestic work that become the bubble house, okay, and this bubble house was designed by architect Anti Lovag. Well, these two designers, they are soul made. They share the same taste. Anti Lava was inspired by the forms of nature. Whether to, for economic reasons or lack of technical solutions, human beings have confined themselves to cubes full of dead ends and angles that impede our movement and break our harmony. To him, the straight line is an aggression against nature. Circle is the simplest construction. It has just one dimension, the radius. And this is transformed into the three-dimensional sphere, which is the lightest, strongest, most material efficient form. For the interior uh, part, okay, Kadan furnished the bubble house also with the circular uh, circular form of furniture. Okay. Uh, he went for the curves for the walls, the beds, the armchairs, and the baths. We present you with a fashion icon or topic. Today we're looking at 15 things you didn't know about Pierre Cardin. Welcome to Alux.com, the place where future billionaires come to get inspired. Hello Aluxers, today we're looking at an avant-garde fashion designer, none other than Pierre Cardin. Pierre Cardin was born July 7th, 1922 in San Andrea de Barbara in Italy. In 1926, his parents moved to Saint Etienne, France, where Cardon grew up. His parents wanted him to become an architect in the future, but at the age of eight years old, Cardon showed interest in fashion and design when he would like to dress up the dolls of his neighbor. He was given a job at Vichy by a French tailor called Manby. It's there where he learned the art of tailoring suits. 
After working with Manby, he worked with many other designers, and in 1950, he decided to set up his own shop. He launched his first design collection in 1953. He opened a boutique in 1954 named Eve, and later added another one called Adam in 1957. Cardon became a leader in design and fashion worldwide. Around the globe, many people think Cardon's design and fashion came from the people he worked for. What they don't know is that Cardon was also a creative and hardworking designer who aimed to take over the world. If you're new here, welcome. Be sure to subscribe and follow us on Instagram at Alux. So, let's cut to the chase and take a closer look at this unique designer right now with the 15 things you didn't know about Pierre Cardin. Number 1. In his early career, Pierre Cardin worked for Christian Dior and Jean Cocteau. Pierre Cardin got his first job in 1946 as a tailor, working under Christian Bernard and Jean Cocteau. This involved a lot of designing for a film version of Beauty and the Beast, which was an exciting opportunity for him. He was able to draw attention to his skills, which landed him the job in Christian Dior's fashion house back in 1946. During this time, he mastered all the vital skills in fashion and design to the point where he could venture out on his own. Number two, he was the first to display his logo on his garments. Today, it's very common to see brands display their logo on their garments, especially in the luxury sector. This actually only became the trend since the 1960s. And who started that trend? Pierre Cardin, of course. He had the visionary idea to incorporate his logo into his designs, and this actually shocked the fashion world when the first garments featuring the logo came onto the market. Then many other fashion brands began following the trend themselves, and countless brands still embrace this form of design today. Number 3. Pierre Cardin pursued architecture in 1945 in Paris, but never became an architect. Pierre Cardin's parents had a very specific expectation for him. They strongly wanted him to become an architect. Of course, by the time Cardin was a teenager, it was clear his true passion was in fashion. But in 1945, after moving to Paris, while he was working under many other clothing designers, he did actually study architecture and thought about making that his career. It soon became clear that this interest in fashion overtook his interest in architecture, so he went down the path of becoming a fashion designer instead and never looked back. Number 4. Pierre Cardin's space-age designs made him internationally known. One of the most successful periods of Pierre Cardin's career was when he introduced futuristic space-age designs, which became an instant hit all over the world. This clothing line featured geometrical shapes and motifs, and he ignored the female form that was commonly used at this time, advancing into unisex fashion. This was experimental and sometimes practical, making it very unique in the market. One example is the famous bubble dress that sold in great numbers worldwide. Number 5. His net worth is $800 million. Pierre enjoyed a very successful career in fashion, and his bank account reflected that. Now at the age of 96, his net worth is around $800 million. This is about four times the current net worth of Karl Lagerfeld. His success is largely based on the unique nature of his designs and the popularity of his bubble dress and unisex garments. Number 6. Pierre Cardin was expelled from the Chamber Syndicate in 1959. The Chamber Syndicate is a prestigious trade association of high fashion in France, and in 1959, Cardin was expelled from this syndicate. While in Paris, Cardin introduced ready-to-wear clothes for women. This move of creating such outfits was seen as a threat to the values of haute couture. Members of the Chamber agreed that the designs of Cardin were disrupting the business culture of Paris fashion houses, which were mainly focused on profits. Pierre, on the other hand, was focused on building his brand. He was later reinstated, but he resigned in 1966. Number 7. He caused great conflict when he bought a castle in France. When Pierre Cardin bought a castle in Lacoste, France, it caused some major conflict. Pierre had great plans and ideas to develop the place into a hospitable resort that many people worldwide would love to visit and enjoy. Unfortunately, Cardin's ideas were not well received by many people. Pierre wanted to help the residents in different ways, since he's rich and wanted to build his legacy. But the Lacoste people did not think he fit into the area, and wanted nothing to do with him. 
They criticized his actions harshly and tried to convince him to leave. Number 8. Pierre Cardin lost a trademark dispute in Indonesia. In Indonesia, there was a businessman by the name of Alexander Wibowo who used the same brand name as Cardin for manufacturing his products. The Supreme Court in Indonesia rejected a lawsuit filed by Pierre Cardin, saying Alexander Wibowo had already filed and registered the Pierre Cardin trademark on July 29, 1977, three decades before Pierre Cardin registered the brand in that country. This was a huge blow to Pierre Cardin and his products in Indonesia, since most of his customers would not be able to determine which products were his and which were Wibowo's. Number 9. Pierre Cardin is the only one besides Neil Armstrong to try on his original spacesuit. It's clear from his designs and aesthetics that Pierre has an interest in the universe beyond Earth. He was captivated by the thought of a man landing on the moon, and he was a bit obsessive about Neil Armstrong's accomplishments. His obsession led him to the opportunity of trying on the actual suit that Neil Armstrong wore on the moon. He's the only other person besides Armstrong to ever do so. He loved it so much, he later designed his own suit for NASA in 1970. Number 10. His bubble mansion sold for $335.8 million. In the early 90s, Pierre bought a very unique house called the Bubble Palace, built on top of a mountain range in the French Riviera. The nearly 13,000 square foot home took almost 14 years to build and was completed in 1989. The mansion has 28 spherical rooms, a 500 seat amphitheater, 10 suites with round beds, a round swimming pool, and gardens. It's listed as a historic monument by the French Ministry of Culture. The home has been the setting of many notable events and fashion shows. Cardin put it on the market in 2015, and it recently sold for $335.8 million. And if you'd like to see how this house compares with other high-dollar homes worldwide, you can do so by checking out our video, The Top 10 Most Expensive Houses in the World. Just click in the top right corner to check it out. Number 11. He was one of the first French designers to create a special trim package for American cars. In the 1970s, Pierre Cardin took a dive into industrial design, and he started focusing his interests on automobiles. In 1972, he got a contract with the American Motor Corporation, or AMC, who decided to incorporate one of Cardin's themes into their AMC Javelin in 1972. He became one of the first French designers to design a special trim package for an American car. His trim package was described as having some of the wildest fabrics and patterns ever found in an American vehicle. Number 12. Pierre Cardin opened the museum in Paris where all of his diverse collections can be found. Pierre Cardin wanted to have a place where people across the whole world could have access to his designs from 1953 to his most recent collection. So, he opened up a museum located at Rue Saint-Marie. Here, a wide range of Pierre Cardin work is seen. The first showcase is comprised of 200 of Cardin's most impressive high fashion designs. These include a proper camel color dress, a barely there metallic mini dress, and daring crop tops, showing the range and diversity of his work and the unique skills he's gained over the years. In addition, you'll find furniture designs, accessories, and jewelry in his unique stylings. Number 13. Pierre Cardin's children's wear and men's casual wear had an immense impact on worldwide fashion. 1966 was another great year for Pierre Cardin because this is when he introduced his clothing collection for children. These clothes were loved because they were fancy, colorful, and easy to fit. Due to their special look, this collection became so popular throughout the world that many other designers worldwide followed suit with their own children's lines. In the same year, Cardin introduced a casual fashion collection for men as well, which had an immense influence on the look of American and British menswear. For these and other designs, he got the Golden Spinning Wheel Award from the town of Krefeld in Germany. Number 14. He bought the Maxime's restaurant chain in 1981. Maxime's in Paris, France, was once considered to be the most famous restaurant in the world. It was particularly known for its Art Nouveau decor. Maxime's has been around since 1893, and it's been a cultural landmark in Paris for over 100 years. 
1981, Pierre decided to purchase the Maxime's restaurant chain. He has since opened new locations in Tokyo, Beijing, London, Brussels, Geneva, and Monaco. He also has marketed a number of food items under the Maxime name. Number 15. Pierre Cardin was a pioneer of ready-to-wear. When Pierre Cardin was reinstated back into the chamber syndicate, this was a sign that ready-to-wear was the future of the fashion industry. After a while, these collections were allowed in the Paris market, since it was easy to purchase them, unlike the usual couture tradition that required one to be measured before the purchase. This trend was picked up worldwide, and Pierre Cardin was the pioneer who introduced high-quality ready-to-wear in the retail world. Fashion magazines then helped the trend to go global. Furthermore, Cardin established a new entrepreneur model to the fashion industry that forever changed its mode of business. And that's it, Aluxers, the 15 things you didn't know about Pierre Cardin. Now, before you go, we're curious. Do you think Pierre Cardin gets the recognition in the fashion industry he deserves, or do you think he's overlooked? Let us know what you think in the comments. And as always, for sticking with us all the way to the end, you know you get a bonus fact. Here it is. Number 16. Pierre Cardin. Circles and spheres are the most approachable shapes with no sharp edges to risk an injury. And that explains why we love polka dot. Our love of polka dot is integrated, is programmed, and is deeply embedded in our brain. Our emotional brain understands this intuitively and unconsciously. We prefer wrong forms over angular ones. People associate curved forms with safety and positivity, and people associate sharp angles with danger and negativity. Polka dots are fun and flirty, and the most cheerful pattern ever. You know, we cannot help but smile when we see someone wearing polka dots, right? So they are really the epitome, epitome of happiness. You know, I prefer to think of polka dots as a lively summer print that reminds me not to take myself and the world too seriously, let's have some fun. This is one of the most memorable fashion uh, moment in this uh, iconic movie, the Pretty Woman. I love this dress. Marilyn Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor, you know, many celebrities, they love to wear polka dots. Let's look at some uh, really pretty polka dot fashion. Polka dots for interior design. Indeed, polka dot really bring the joy, the fun into our living space. Even Mini wearing polka dots. Okay. In 1928, Disney introduced Minnie Mouse, you know, the red polka dot dress and the matching bow.
Yayoi Kusama is a Japanese contemporary artist. She has been acknowledged as one of the most important living artists to come out of Japan. So her work is all about polka dot. A polka dot has the form of the sun, which is a symbol of the energy of the whole world and our living life, and also the form of the moon, which is calm, round, soft, colorful, senseless, and unknowing. Polka dots can't stay alone like the communicative life of people. Two or three polka dots become movement. Polka dots are a way of infinity. In 2012, Louis Vuitton collaborated with Kusama and launched a collection of uh, design that including handbags, clothes, and accessories. Okay, and this is one of the most visually captivating collections that Louis Vuitton has ever, ever collaborated with artists. Hi, I'm Sheila Sim, and you're in Singapore Takashimaya pop up store for Louis Vuitton Yaoi Kusama. created in collaboration between Marc Jacobs and Yayoi Kusama. Yayoi Kusama is a legendary Japanese artist. She's just on 83. She started creating in the 1940s and she has absolutely created an amazing body of work including painting, sculpture, installation, performance and film. I love the idea that I saw with Mexico is polka dots and I love polka dots. Coming into the store just makes me feel so happy. Just look around the store and you will see. It's like a fantasy world in here and the designs, the bags, the wallets, everything is just polka dots. It is a pop-up store meaning that uh, the store will open officially to the public on a Sunday. This pop-up store is one of only seven pop-up stores in the world. So we have pop-up stores also in London, New York, Tokyo, Paris and Hong Kong and Singapore. We are obviously really proud and really excited to be part of this collaborative effort, which is also recognizing Singapore as one of the major cities in the world. It's so colorful and it's just fashionable yet very wearable and I, I really really like them. I really love it very much. We are going to wrap up the lecture by stepping back and look into the nature. I, I am a big fan of nature's design. Okay, I really think that she is the best design, designer ever. And look at the anatomy of the human body. Is There is plenty of cylinder form and spherical form. 
our neck is a pivot joint, right? The shoulder, the hip, and the knee are the ball and socket joints. Our elbow is a hinge joint. It is this spherical and cylinder structure that make us to be a movable and living creature. I was a physicist, so physics is really more than a science to me. It is a world view. Before we understand the world as a three-dimensional uh, space and time, right? So it's like an X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z space. So each plane, each field is flat, right? The X, Y, Z is a mathematically perfect straight line that should extend to the uh, end of the universe. By this understanding, the universe should be in a cubical form. However, Albert Einstein's general relativity completely revolutionized this world view. The universe is a circular form. Space curves when matter and energy is present. So the gravity of a massive object bends the fabric of space and time. Even light, even light follows the contours of space-time. So you see the universe, the fabrication of the universe is in a circular form. A good example is the solar system, right? The sun is such a a massive object and it curved the space, you know, uh, it curved the space, it bent the space. So therefore the earth will be affected by this bend and have to move along a curved path around the sun. So therefore circle is not just a pretty shape. Circle is the innate pattern of the universe.